KubeCon. Um, I'm very excited to be here with all of you. Um, this talk is called High Reliability Infrastructure Migrations. Um, all right, I'm an infrastructure engineer at Stripe. Um, all you need to know about Stripe for this talk is we're a payments company. We process billions of dollars for a year for our users. Um, and what does that mean about our priorities, right? What are our challenges in infrastructure? Um, we do not process 10 bajillion of queries per second. If we did, my equity would be worth more. Um, we don't have like 20, like we don't need to return results in 20 milliseconds. What we care about in infrastructure is reliability and we care about security. Right, um, I could have like written this whole talk about security and Kubernetes, but it's going to be about reliability. Um, that's what we had time for. Um, and a lot of the services that we need to operate at Stripe um, need to like have availability of four nines or above, right? Um, and if you want to be up 99.99% of the time, I calculated this and I was like, oh, it's about a, you can be down about a minute a week, right? Um, including like everything that goes wrong, not just like what you may have done to your infrastructure. Um, so it's not a lot of time. Right, um, we, I'm gonna be talking about sort of two changes we made in this talk. Um, one of them is we moved uh, some of our workloads to Kubernetes, we moved a bunch of cron jobs, a bunch of machine learning work workloads, as well as some of our HTTP services. Um, and we also uh, started, uh, moved to using Envoy for all of our sort of service to service networking, uh, which is like a really big internal networking change um, and to use mutual CLS. Um, and when I started working on this, um, I didn't know for either of these projects anything about Kubernetes or Envoy, and I really wish that I was like, okay, I could, I wish I had this like list of like everything that could possibly go wrong, and then I could write down all of the solutions, and then I could like make, deploy new infrastructure and everything would just work, and we wouldn't have any problems. Um, and this was the, the, the reality, right? Is I was like me, and I was like, what could go wrong? I don't know, <laughs> probably a lot of stuff. <laughs> How are we gonna get there, right? Like, how are we gonna go from like, we know nothing about how to operate the software, um, or very little, to like, we're confident running critical uh, production software on this, right? And we're comfortable like, promising our users that this will be fine. Um, it's a really big leap. So this talk is about like, what is the process, right? Like, how do you get from here to there? Um, and the, the way I think about this process is that we have sort of like, what could go wrong in your infrastructure, and these red dots are sort of like things that could possibly go wrong. And on the left, we kind of have like normal problems where like if you talk to anyone at KubeCon, they'll be like, oh yeah, we saw that too, that happens all the time. Um, there are problems on the right where you're like, DNS did what? Like, um, which, which are maybe much more uncommon, uh, but that you still have, like, I mean, who has had these problems, right? Where you're like, what happened? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, it's the reality. And, um, so if you want to run a high availability service, right, that's going to be up all the time, you need to deal with like a substantial number of these issues that are more like on the like what happened end of the spectrum and you need to be prepared for them. Um, and how do you do that when you don't know anything at the beginning? Um, so the goal is to like fix all these problems, right, somehow. So how are we gonna do that? Um, let's do it. Uh, understand the design, run game days, classify your failures, have incidents only one time, my favorite, um, and like make incremental changes. So let's do it. Um, step one is understanding Kubernetes design. Um, I'm not gonna go into this a lot, but I think it is really important to like, realize that like, if you're gonna run software in production, you need to know how it's designed, right? Like you need to know how it works. Um, for, in Kubernetes case, the sort of like basic version of this is that you have etcd, that's where our state is stored, you have the API server, and then you have like all these stateless services which you need to worry about a little bit less. We, we operate Kubernetes ourselves right now, um, so it's really important for us to understand this, right? Um, another consequence of this um, is that we try to really focus our efforts on a really small set of software. So we use Kubernetes, we use Envoy, we don't use any of this other stuff, right? I don't know what it is for the most part. Um, and I think really focusing really helps us build much more high reliability systems. Um, but okay, so like, let's say you've like learned something about how Kubernetes is designed. You know the basics. Um, you still don't know how it can break, right? You can't Google like how can Kubernetes break. Um, it doesn't, it will not help, um, right? You need to learn how to, your system breaks in practice. Um, so uh, you set up Kubernetes, um, and like you install it. Uh, and then like the first, I think one of the first things that we started to do is like, okay, let's cause some problems on purpose, right? Like we can come up with failure modes that we know will happen uh, because like everything goes wrong uh, in reality. Um, and let, let's make them happen. Uh, so we call these game days. Uh, lots of people have other names for them. Um, but uh, what, what they do is they test how your system beha behaves under like known failure conditions, right? 
um, when those failures happen, it lets you learn how to deal with them, kind of like not at four in the morning, um, which is when I have learned about some failure conditions. Um, and there, it turns out that they're a really good way to like share knowledge on your team. Um, a couple of examples of things we do. One of my favorite game days with Kubernetes is to like terminate all the API servers and see what happens. And the first time I did this, I was like, what will happen? Will it work? They claim that my pods will keep running, will they? And they did. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I terminated all the API servers and my pods are still running. <laughs> Before we get too excited, we did this again recently where we were like, oh, there are now some problems because we've made our system more complicated. Um, so it's good to run these things repeatedly, even when you think you know how your system works, because sometimes it's changed. Um, and you, you can do all kinds of things to break your system, right? And it's great to do lots of them. Some of them we do in KB, also sometimes do them in production. Um, usually when we're more sure that they'll work, but it, it makes sense, right? You're, these things are gonna happen in production anyway, so it might as well happen when you're there. Um, it's better. Um, they also let us sort of like test our fixes. Um, we had this issue early on in, in, um, in our use of Kubernetes when Kubernetes terminated every running pod in our cluster. Um, this is something called like pod eviction. Um, anyway, and we were like, oh, okay, cool. Good to know that that can happen. Um, and so we like made some Kubernetes configuration changes um, and then we tested the fix, right? We're, like we reproduced the failure mode where we like terminated just one API server and we're like, okay, it does more like the right thing now. <laughs> Good. Um, all right, uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is like how to sort of classify your failure modes. Because um, when I started out using Kubernetes, I kind of had this feeling like anything could happen, right? Like, uh, I'm so terrified. Um, and this is not true. Um, most of the failure modes that we see with Kubernetes in practice are one, like pods don't start for various reasons. Um, there are sometimes permissions errors where we don't configure Kubernetes correctly um, to like, like uh, their pods to have access to the resources we need, and we see networking issues. Um, and like pods don't start for so many reasons, right? Like there could be a bug in the scheduler, which is something that happened. There could be a bug in like the cron job controller, which is something that happened. SCD could be down. Could have like IAM problems. We could have like problems in our application. There are so many reasons. Um, but we want to have monitoring for all of them. And so having this kind of classification, like pods don't start is a problem, right? For like who knows why. Um, we can develop monitoring. So we built this thing called the, what we call the heartbeat job. And basically what it does is it tries to start a pod every minute. Um, and if the pod doesn't start, someone gets paged. I'm, I'm, technically, I'm not on call right now, uh, but after this talk, I will be on call again. Um, so like if the heartbeat job doesn't run, I'll get paged and then I can go do something about it, right? Um, and it's really comforting to know that, um, that, that I'm sort of protected from like this like, class of issues, or at least I will know about it. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is my very favorite thing, uh, which is like have every incident only one time. Uh, because, uh, like we have this problem in space, right? Like these things that could go wrong. Um, and like, as, like you can like test Kubernetes, right? You can learn how it works. Um, you can run game days. But like ultimately you're gonna run into some problems in production. Like it happens. Um, and ideally you've been just sort of doing a slow rollout. So when those problems happen to you initially in production and like Kubernetes terminates all the pods in your cluster, you're like, oh good, we weren't running anything too important, which was the case, which is great. Um, but you need to fix these issues, right? Um, and if you don't fix like the issue, like, you want to fix every issue so that it sort of never comes back. Because if you don't do that, you can never focus on the stuff, which is like really hard and weird to fix. Um, and then you can never sort of get to the reliability that you need. Um, so it's kind of like if you just like want to have the time on your team to deal with your issues, you need to have incidents only one time. Um, and the kind of like process for this is pretty simple in principle, right? Like you have a problem, you find your causes, you implement some remediations. Usually the problem never comes back. Um, in general, I'm not that superstitious. Like, I'm a really big believer in like, something went wrong, we will figure it out, and then it'll never come back. Like, we will apply logic. Systems are logical. Um, like, there are no like gremlins in my Kubernetes cluster. I don't believe in that. Um, but um, something that is important, I think, is to fix like categories of incidents, right? And not just like sort of individual things that happen. Um, so one example of this with Envoy um, is we started seeing, so we started moving to Envoy and I would see a lot of weird issues, like there would be request timeouts or like slow requests or connection timeouts or like these weird like thundering herd issues where like a ton of connections would get created and it would use all the CPU. And I, like we were able to come up with remediations for most of them. Um, and, I, and I could kind of understand them, but I was like, why? Like fundamentally, like why is this happening to us, right? Like Envoy is supposed to be good, it is good, but like, why, so why is this happening, right? Like, why are there all these weird issues? Um, and the way we were running Envoy is we ran this connection pool of HTTP1 uh, connections between every pair of Envoys uh, in our cluster. 
Um, and these were using TLS, and it turns out that like every single one of these like weird issues were all issues with the HTTP1 connection pool. Um, and it turns out that Envoy is really designed for these connections between two Envoys to use HTTP2. Um, and so we switched to using HTTP2 uh, just like pretty recently for like one of one of one of our um, one of our one of our like our biggest cluster because um, we're like we need to do something to improve things here. Um, and everything just got better. And I was like, oh wow, thank God, <laughs> right? Like. Um, like we, I think we found like the, the the reason that all this weird stuff was happening, and I think it's important to like, well, like if it feels like you're sort of like putting a bandaid on a bunch of problems, um, to try to be like, is there like a, another like more root cause for this, right? Um, because often there is. Um, oops, yeah, that's right. All right. Um, the next thing that's very important for making sure that your incidents happen only once is to tell your coworkers what you learned from incidents. Um, we had another incident early on where we put Etsy on EBS, um, and then we ran into like right throttling, and we had leader elections, we fixed it, we moved it off EBS, um, and then we did the same exact same thing again, because like it didn't get communicated that this happened, right? Um, I was just looking at this, uh, this thing that happened with like all the pods getting killed. And my coworker had wrote this like beautiful three-page incident report last December. And I was like, oh, that's exactly what happened. And it's so nice to go be able, like go and read like all of the details about this incident and like what exactly caused it and how you investigated it. Um, and it helps so much. Uh, and then like you're not the only one who knows. And if you go on vacation, it's fine. Um, so something that someone asked me when I was writing this talk was like, what if I can't figure out? what caused this incident, right? Uh, which is a real concern. There have been incident things that I couldn't figure out. Um, I think, like, it, it's hard. Um, but I think it's important to think of this as like an opportunity um, to learn. Like, incidents teach you how to build a reliable system, right? Um, and I feel like everything I know is from investigating incidents and being like, oh, okay, that's why this happened. Um, if you wanna know, I don't know, if you wanna know more about like how to do this, maybe see every other talk I've ever given. Um, <laughs> that's uh, the only other thing I talk about. Um, all right, next thing, make incremental changes. Uh, this, is, this is obviously key, right? Um, like if you're starting out running Kubernetes, you don't want to start running it on your most like, critical thing. Um, you want to start running it somewhere like a little less scary. Um, there are a lot of really common ways to do this. You can be like, okay, let's do 1% of traffic, 0.1% of traffic, 5% of traffic, a less critical service, just one host. Um, this is all extremely important. I think it's pretty well understood. Um, an another way to make incremental changes to a system in general, I think that's really nice, is to establish an interface boundary. Um, so we had this deploy system kind of circa 2017, which was a little like scary. Um, there may be some ghosts in it, we didn't really feel like, and I said I don't believe in gremlins, but I think we kind of felt a little bit, it was, felt a little gremlin-y. Um, and so my coworker John took on a rewrite of the system, and what he did was he just sort of like set up an interface boundary in the middle of the system, right? That was like typed, and that was really clear. <laughs> um, and this was a huge improvement, right? This is much better. Because um, then you can start to gradually work on your system. And you can be like, okay, new client, server is still the same. Um, and then we, uh, here are the new server. Um, and it was beautiful. It's much, now we understand it. Um, he has this really great post about this called No Haunted Forest, which I really recommend reading. Um, it's wonderful. Um, I want to talk about a little tiny bit about interfaces. Um, this, is, uh, this is just, this is not a normative statement. This is just our approach, uh, to be clear. I don't want to start like a flame war. Um, but the reason that we do this is that we feel it reduces cognitive load um, for our developers who are busy like trying to understand the global payment system. And who, frankly, I don't think have time to understand Kubernetes. Um, and to reduce our support burden, right? Like if we define clear interfaces for how people interact with Kubernetes, it's much easier for us to kind of like support that and operate that. Um, uh, I want to show, so we started out by using YAML to sort of establish an interface between us and our users. Um, so we'd be like, okay, here, like, here's like basically how people would configure their cron jobs on Kubernetes. Um, they would define this YAML file, it was really nice. Um, there are a couple of sort of key issues with this. Um, the main one is that it turns out that it was pretty difficult for developers to understand like what other attributes were supported. They were like, what can I put in this YAML file? Is there a schema? Like, how does it work? And like, arguably we could have documented it better, but I feel like this is kind of like a fundamental issue with YAML. Um, and it's also sort of hard for people to tell like from the outside, like what Kubernetes config is this really gonna generate, right? It's, it's not very transparent. Um, and so we, we've started taking the approach instead 
um, of uh, letting people call functions, because we're like, oh, what's an interface? A function is an interface. Everyone understands functions. Um, and so the, the new way that we're um, having people define uh, like Kubernetes services is um, by writing functions um, in this language called Skylark, which I'm gonna talk about a little more in a second. Um, but you're just like, okay, like Stripe service, here's the command, here's how many replicas, here's how much CPU, and then this generates Kubernetes configuration, right? Um, the language that this is in is a subset of Python, it's type checked, it's sandbox, you can run it anywhere, you can run it on the web. I'm gonna show you a demo right now, actually, um, if we can have, can we have a demo? Um, I'm not, will my computer wake up? Will I get, oh yeah, okay, cool. Um, so this is a really simple like uh, WebAssembly demo, demo of this thing. Um, so basically I've defined like a job function which generates a Kubernetes job and takes like a name and a command as arguments. Um, and then I can just call that function and be like, maybe I could rename it to like pool job um, and then like give it a name. And then if it's type checked, right? So if I'm like, oh, name equals two, it'll be like, no, name does not equal two. <laughs> That's not a name. Um, and so I think, I think it's really nice for like infrastructure software um, to, to have this kind of interface. Um, if you're interested in sort of like configuring Kubernetes this way, this is very much like a, an early, like it's not like big and professional, it's a, an early stage thing. Please come work with us on it if you're interested. Um, you can try it out at skyconfig.fun. Um, <laughs> all right, um, the last thing I wanted to say is like, um, always have a rollback plan. Um, I think this maybe has happened to a lot of us where you're like, oh, I thought this was going to work, oops. And it's really, really good um, when, when this happens, you're like, oh, good, I had just rolled this up to 1% and I'm gonna roll it back down to 0% and it's fine, right? And uh, go, going into sort of like every change with a plan to like, how are we gonna detect if this goes wrong? And like, here's how I'm gonna roll it back in five minutes if it does, um, makes me sleep a lot better and makes my deploys feel a lot safer. Um, all right, um, so this was our playbook. Um, this is what we know about, this is what I've learned so far about how to like operate Kubernetes. And a, as a result, um, I think my team has had no like very serious like Kubernetes incidents, even through making some pretty major changes, it's worked pretty well, um, which was surprising to me because we started out being like, what is this stuff? Um, and so that's nice. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of like team culture um, because reliability is not like something that I do by myself, right? Reliability is a team sport. Um, we all do it together. And I think on our team, it's okay to start out not being an expert, but like the people on the team need to become experts, right? We need to really deeply understand the software. We need to know how it works. We need to know what its failure modes are. Um, and for, to get everyone on the team there, it means that we need to kind of build this like engine of learning on our team where everybody is learning um, they're learning about how the cluster can fail. Maybe we do game days together and we're like, hey, let's go all see how this thing fails together. When we write incident reports, it means we need to share them and make sure that other people understand them and don't just kind of like throw them out there um, and like talk them through, right? Um, if you find something weird, explain to other people on your team what happened. Uh, and building this XP takes a ton of time. We've been using Kubernetes for a year and a half. And we know a lot about how to use it now, but I don't think that we're done, right? Like we're not running our most critical stuff on Kubernetes still. Um, I think that learning a lot of this software is a really long process um, and it's a big investment. If you're um, a manager, um, one thing that my manager does that has made a huge difference is every time I say to him like, hey Jay, um, this change isn't gonna be happening this week, this weird thing happened and I wanna investigate to make sure that I understand what happened and that we have a plan to make sure it doesn't happen again. He's like, great, thank you, Julia. <laughs> um, that's what we need to do, right? So like, please make space for your team uh, to learn how to fix these issues um, and then you can uh, do amazing things together. Um, that's all I have to say, thank you. Uh,